everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, as we continue with day seven of Food Addiction Recovery Week, today we have an inspiring success story from Zena. We talked about what the diet was this morning with Dr. Alan Goldhammer, but following those principles, Zena was able to lose 100 pounds eating plants, eating lots of starch, and really on the way to managing her food addictions. I don't want to say she's completely recovered. That's going to be something she's going to decide for herself. But hey, she's doing great. She's off her medication. She looks amazing. And please welcome her to the show. Hello, Zena. That is your color, whatever shade of blue that is. I tell you that all the time. Thank you. Thanks, AJ. Yeah. Well, you look great. And I, and I, and not only do you look great now, but I mean, you know, I mean, the your before and after is quite, a, quite a difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, uh, I, I look at it now and I can't, it's really funny. I can't even remember myself that heavy anymore because that my before picture was from 2003. And I found, um, as I was putting together some images for this, interview, I found an old picture of myself with a, with a friend of mine and I took a snapshot of it and I sent it to her and I'm like, do you remember what year this was? And she, we were talking about it and we kind of figured out it was, um, it was probably like 2001 or sometime around then. And, um, she's like, I don't even remember you like that because she's known me since I was really heavy and she's known me since I've lost weight. And she's like, I, I, I don't even think of you that way anymore. So that, that's kind of nice. It's nice to it have that, um, affirmation. And hopefully you don't think of you that way either. No, I don't. I, I mean, it's, I, I still, you know, it's hard because sometimes I still feel quite large and then I'll look at pictures and I'm like, well, I'm not as large as I was. And then other times I feel better about myself. So it kind of, it kind of goes back and forth a little bit. Yeah. Oh my God. Well, did you, did you struggle with your weight as a child? I did. I did. I've got pictures to show some childhood pictures to show you. Um, I wasn't, I mean, when I look at them, it, I think I felt fatter than I actually might have looked because I've always been told I carried my weight well. Um, but whatever that means. You know what I think it means? I think it means you're not as fat as you look. Or, yeah, maybe or that's you don't look as fat as you are. I mean, I always, I, I always wait. Those left handed compliments, it's like, you look good for 60s. I don't like those kind of compliments. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Me too. But yeah, so I, um, I was, I was um, overweight as a, as a, very young child. And I'll, I'll show you some pictures as soon as I start that little presentation I tried to put together. And, um, but I was, um, you know, I was, I was, my parents were slim and I was, when I was born, I, you know, just average baby. I mean, I was like 21 inches long, which was probably a little on the long side. My mom's not very tall. She was only like five, one, I think. Um, and I was uh, seven pounds. So I wasn't like a huge baby. Um, but by the time I was two years old, I was already looking um, a little more rotund. Should I start the presentation so I can you show can, you? Yeah, but I'm curious since nobody else in your family was overweight. Why do you think you were overweight all the way to all the way back from till age of two? Well, yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I I think it was food addiction, honestly, because I rem I don't remember this, but my mother tells me the story that my um, my I used to say juice, juice when I was like a little, when I was a baby, I'd ask for juice. And my dad would give me those like little, you know, those little six ounce cans, you know, of juice. And I would drink one, I'd guzzle it down and I'd say juice, juice. And he'd give me another one. And then I'd ask for another one. He'd give me the entire six pack. And so I drink an entire six pack of juice. And it was like maybe a year old. That's a lot of sugar. <laughs> Yeah. My brother and sister were, my parents were slim. My brother and sister were, slim. I had a younger brother and sister. They were both slim until later in life. Then it kind of reversed. Then everybody started gaining weight, but I was the only one who was heavy from childhood and I was heavier than my, my cousins. You know, I, it, I'm not, I think it has to do with genetics. And I just think that I was kind of hardwired that way because when I talked about the food addiction part of it, one time I was telling my brother, um, some stuff about how I used to experience, um, food because I was from, from like some of my earliest childhood memories were, were like me waking up, getting ready for school and thinking about what I, what I was going to eat. Like, what am I going to eat at breakfast time? And as I was eating breakfast, I'd be thinking, what am I going to eat next? And I'd be walking to school. What am I going to eat? You know, when's lunch at lunch? What am I going to, when do I get to eat after lunch? You know? And it was like the whole, like the whole day. And it happened for my entire life until I was about 42 years old. And then I had a breakthrough. Um, and, you know, I'll tell you more about that, but it was basically 
from going through Dr. McDougall's maximum weight loss program. Um, and that, so a few years after I had that breakthrough, because up to that point, I thought everybody was the same way. I, I didn't realize that people weren't thinking of food every second of every day. Um, so I, uh, I, you know, was telling my brother this um, when I finally realized that this, this was not normal. And my brother kind of looked at me with this real shocked expression on his face. And I said, oh my goodness, you too? And he said, no, but my son, his oldest son was the same way from childhood. Like, and he has weight issues as well. So I, I do think there's a genetic component to it. Not, it didn't hit everybody in my family, but I do believe that everybody in my family did have some level of food addiction. It just didn't manifest itself until later. It didn't physically manifest until a little bit later in life for them because they all gained weight. And I started, once I figured it out, I started to lose weight. So it was kind of did a little bit of a flop. Yeah. So. Right. And that's the thing, because, you know, weight isn't the only marker. There are people that don't have excess weight that still would identify with food addiction. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think that any of my family identified with it. They still don't. But um, but I, I see it. <laughs> I'm not sure even a lot of the plant based doctors do. Yeah, that's true. And it's kind of sad because I um, it, it was such an epiphany when I when I kind of like came, came out of it. And you talk about the calm, stable brain. And the first time I experienced that was um, in 2005. And it was um, four months after, like I had done the maximum weight, I had done the regular McDougal program in 2003. And that helped a little bit. It, the, the thoughts were not as intense, but they were still there. They were definitely still there, but they, it wasn't with that, that sense of urgency, you know, cause I used to be like, what am I going to eat? What am I going to eat? I, you know, honestly, I'm amazed that I was able to get through school, graduate from college, hold down a job because of my, I was just so focused on eating, eating, eating all the time and eating really junky stuff too. It was sugar, fat, salt, you know, you, you name it. That's what I wanted to eat. I didn't want a salad. I wanted, you know, the, when I was a little kid, we loved having frozen dinners. That was my, my parents were both really good cooks and they would cook what would be considered, you know, by most Americans that would be considered healthy, but it was had meat, but my mom always made, my mom loved salad. So we always had salad and I had to choke down the salad, you know, and I didn't want that. Yeah. I wanted the fries and I wanted the, or the potatoes and with the butter on them though. And I wanted the steak or the chicken or whatever. But when we got frozen dinners, you know, those like little Swanson frozen dinners that had the different compartments, had the little dessert and, uh, oh my gosh, that was like, it was like Christmas. You know, we were so excited that, that we had, we got to eat that. Um, so yeah, I always wanted the junky stuff, but when I went through the regular, the first McDougal 10 day program in 2003, that helped to kind of quieted down my um, thought process a little bit. It was still there. It was still there. I was still thinking about food fairly, fairly often, but, but it quieted down a little bit. But then I went in 2005, I went to the, um, first and only, um, maximum weight loss McDougal pro 10 day McDougal program. And I remember Dr. McDougall saying during that program, some of you might find that you will lose certain cravings that you've always had. Like you might even lose your cravings for chocolate. And I was the biggest chocoholic ever in the world. I would eat so much chocolate. My a girlfriend of mine used to make this super sweet, like really sickeningly sweet fudge at Christmas time. And nobody would eat it except me. And I would, I would eat the entire plate because nobody was eating it. And I just kept shoveling it in. And it was, I was said to Dr. McDougall afterwards, I'm like, Dr. McDougall, I, I buy everything that you're saying, no problem here. Um, by now he'd been my doctor for two years. So uh, I, he knew that I believed everything he was talking about. I said, but I don't think I'm ever gonna lose my cravings for chocolate. And he just smiled in his very wise, you know, wise way. And he said, well, we'll see. And that's all he said to me. And I was like, okay, we'll see. And then for almost four months to the day, it was almost exactly four months later because the program happened in January of 2005 and my birthday's in mid April. And so mid April, it was right around my birthday. I remember waking up in the morning, getting ready, going to work, getting to work and thinking to myself, did I forget something? Did I leave the iron plugged in? Did I turn off the stove? Did I close the garage? And I was thinking something seemed off and I couldn't think of what it was. And that happened to me for several days. And then the third or fourth day, I realized I wasn't thinking about food. I was waking up, I was getting ready. I was packing my lunch and everything, but I was not, I wasn't having those thoughts. And it was just like, oh my goodness, that compulsion was just gone. And in its place, it was just, it was so, it felt like a miracle. And I've never, I've never done drugs. I never smoked. 
I barely drank alcohol. I used to drink a little bit of alcohol, but not, not very much. So I've never known those kinds of addictions, but that food thing, it was so funny. It was like, I almost, I had to go into recovery to even realize that I had food addiction, if that makes sense. Because up to that point, I just thought everybody was like me. I did not realize that, you mean other people don't think about food 95% of the day? They don't really? And when that went away for me, I was like, oh, this is better. This is, this must be what regular people feel like, you know? So it was, it was very interesting. Yeah. So, yeah. That was wow, that, that is that you know, I think the difference between the regular starch solution program and the McDougal Maximum Weight Loss Program isn't even so much the weight loss, it's for those of us that are sensitive to the effects of some of those foods, like the little bit of sugar, the little bit of salt or flour, which many people can eat without. Uh, harming themselves or and still reverse their disease. For those of us with these sensitive brains, those those what's that's what's going to make the difference. I think. Yeah, absolutely. And then for me, when those things are combined with any kind of fat, and I don't, I don't just mean oil. Oil is the worst. But even when they're combined with higher calorie dense foods and, you know, like nuts and seeds or something, nut butters, uh, tahini, because I used to love tahini. Um, when those things are combined with the higher fat foods. Uh, it, it's, it's like a big old brain bomb. Yeah. It's, it's not, it's, it's a problem for me. It's definitely a problem. Yeah. And I love, I love bread. You know, I grew up eating pita bread and hummus and it was, you know, really hard to give up the bread, you know, and I, I don't live, you know, as you know, I don't live in a clean environment. Um, I live, my mom lives with me. I care for her and I have things for her that I don't eat. So it does become problematic for me. Um, because I, I, uh, you know, it's there and I try to block it and I'm mostly successful. Sometimes I slip. And when I slip, it can be a very slippery slope and I have to be very careful with that. So, um, that's why I don't believe that I'm fully recovered because it's always going to be there. I, I had, I had recovered, like, like I said, back in 2005, but when I slipped and sometimes I had big slips and it, I would start eating those things again and it came roaring back, you know? So I don't think it's, I think it's probably like alcoholism. It's if, if somebody's a true alcoholic and they stop drinking, it never really goes away. It's just always, in the, you know, it's always back there behind you, just ready to kick up its heels again. As soon as you give it an inch, it's, it's going to just come roaring back. So I feel that's for me, that's what my, the food addiction feels like. Yeah. Well, Jerry says you've given her such encouragement knowing that the environment isn't clean. And Susanna said she loves the way you've been describing losing your cravings. You know, when you talked about hummus, I think about when I used to go a long time ago to like Middle Eastern restaurants and the hummus already had tahini and probably oil in it. And then they would just glug, glug, glug the oil on top. And it's like, whoa. Well, you know, traditional hummus does not have oil in it. It has oil on top of it, exactly the way you described. They have the tahini in it, and then they they drizzle olive oil on top. So yeah, and but nowadays, if you go to buy commercial hummus, most of it does have oil already in it, as well as the tahini. It's like, why do you need both? They're both formed. Just have the tahini. If you go to a Middle Eastern store, though, you can buy canned hummus that has no oil, but it does have tahini in it. So, yeah, well, I guess they put more fat, make it more addictive. How long did it take you to lose the 100 pounds? Well, that's <laughs> that's kind of the interesting uh, part of it because it's um, I probably lost I think like 87 pounds within the first two years, and then I started, you know, I, I lost 45 pounds very quickly the first you know, in the first four months, I think, and a big portion of that had to have been water, of course, but, and then maybe another 10 pounds during that first year. So about a total of 55 pounds the first year. And then I started waffling because they opened up a native foods, like literally two minutes from where I worked. And the first week they were open, I was there four times. I, I mean, seriously. And I wasn't, I wasn't trying to order any, you know, things without oil. I just was wanting to eat what they had there. And vegan restaurants have kind of been my downfall. When I fall off track, historically, it's been because I've started going to vegan restaurants. It's like, I want to sample and I want to take, um, you know, I want to take friends, you know, non-vegan friends there and say, look at how good it is, you know, just because I want them to stop eating animals. So. Um, so when that happened, it's like, I, 
you know, I started gaining a few pounds back. So maybe I gained back 10 pounds that, you know, of the 55 that, that I lost. And then the next year, what, then after when I went to the, um, the, in 2005, when I went to the maximum weight loss program, um, I ended up losing a, a, a grand total with the weight that I lost from the first program and then the second program, about 80, 85, 86 pounds, something like that. So it was about two years that I, I lost about 86, 87 pounds. And then I maintained that for a while. Um, but then I, I think back in 2007, my dad started getting ill, 2008, and his illness was progressing. And um, I started waffling. And I wanted, I do want to say one thing here that I, um, I, I am a stress eater. Like many people say, oh, I can't do this because I eat, you know, I, I, I eat when I'm stressed. I eat when I'm stressed too. When I was doing really well, um, after the 2005 maximum weight loss program, I was super stressed at my work. I hated my job. I was in a job for many years that I, I couldn't stand. Honestly, I used to cry before I'd go into work because I didn't like it. And, um, and I should have quit and I didn't, but I was super, I was under really crazy deadlines and I'd be mad at people. And I, but what I was eating was baby carrots and sugar snappies. And I just shove them down my mouth, you know, and I chomp on them really hard and I, would, and I would take out my anger on the carrots, you know, and I would eat cherry tomatoes and the sugar snap peas and the little, you know, bell peppers, the sweet bell peppers and stuff like that. So I, I don't think it's stress I, because I think we're going to eat no matter whether we're stressed, whether we're happy, whether we're sad, we're always going to be eating. We have to eat, but it just depends on what we're eating. And it also depends on if we get so stressed that it starts interfering with our self-care then that can become problematic. And that's what happened for me because when I when I, bad things started happening, I stopped taking care of myself. I stopped preparing my food. I stopped doing all the things. And I started, again, going to vegan restaurants and I wasn't careful with the oil, you know, the sugar, salt, and oil. Um, I was just eating whatever and, you, you know, using it to comfort myself. So I was using the wrong food to comfort myself. If, had I continued to chomp on baby carrots, I don't think I would have regained any weight. So um, from 2000 and let's see, from 2008, around 2008 to 2011 or so, um, I gained back, you know, about, I was, I was losing and gaining about five to 25 pounds during that period of time. I'd lose some weight. I gained some back, lose some weight, gain some back. After my father died, I'd probably gain back about 25 or 30 pounds. And um, then in 2012, I met AJ, yay. And you were doing your unprocessed class at the time. And I was still doing, I still wanted to be doing maximum weight loss. So I was taking your classes because I loved having that support. That community was so great. You were cooking up yummy stuff. I was learning stuff from you, you know, with, with that. And for that six, the first six months of 2012, that was probably some of the best six months of my life because I got fit. I, I lost, I lost the weight I gained plus, and then some. Um, and so I, lost like maybe 35 pounds. Like I'd probably gained like 25 back and I'd lost like 35. So yeah, so that got me up to about 97 pounds. And that was in 2012, like mid 2012. And then from 2012, uh, the, the second part of 2012, if the first half was really good, the second half was really, really horrible because everything, I mean, it just, everything went to hell in a handbasket. I had a bunch of family deaths happen. Um, I had to move, leave my leave my clean home environment and move in to take care of my mom um, when my sister passed away. And so that happened very suddenly. I wasn't anticipating that. So I didn't have any time, you know, to prepare for it. And I moved in and uh, in an unclean environment and I remained pretty good for the first year, but then other things happened. More people died. You know, my dog got sick. Then, you know, my best friend got sick. She died. And then my dog died. And it was just like one thing after another, I had, you know, a couple of other family members pass away. And then there were some family members who attempted suicide who thankfully didn't die, but you know, it was, and work was crazy. It was all this kind of crazy stuff. But again, it's not the stuff that, because stuff happens. People have bad stuff happen all the time. But what happened was I was not able to continue prepping and doing the things that had gotten me to where, you know, where I had been before. So, and you the whole time, so that, that period, that bad period of time, that's like kind of my dark ages, I call it was from 2000, mid 2012 to mid 2016. And AJ, I really do thank you because you 
kept reaching out to me. You didn't give up on me. And I was so thankful that you didn't give up on me. And you kept calling me and saying, Hey, I'm going to have another class. Do you want to come back? You know, and it wasn't that I didn't want to come back, but I was, I felt like I was drowning and I don't know how to swim. This, so this, I'm using this analogy and I was trying to tread water and you kept trying to throw me, um, you know, the lifesaver thing. And I couldn't grab it because I was just trying to tread water. So, it, and it wasn't that I didn't want to come back. I wanted it with my whole heart, you know, um, and I was slowly gaining weight back. In that four year period of time, I gained back like 35, 40 pounds. So the weight that I'd lost and then plus another five pounds, but I still kept off about the first 55 pounds that I lost from the original, you know, the when I first started um, eating uh, plant-based. So I didn't, I never regained back the whole hundred pounds. You know, I, I gained back some of it. Um, and then in uh, mid 2016, you contacted me one last time. And by then I was starting to come out of the dark tunnel. You know, it was, um, it was starting to have a little light and I came out of it and um, I was debating. It's like, what should I do? And I, I, I was really embarrassed. I mean, I gained back almost 40 pounds and I was like, I don't want people to see me. I don't want, you know, I, you know, I don't like people to, um, you know, look at me and, but you reached out and I thought I'm just going to take the plunge and do it. And by then you had started your UWL program, which was perfect for me because it was so aligned with um, the maximum weight loss program. And so I was like, okay, sign me up. And I went, and then over the, the next several years, I think I was taking classes with you from 2016 to 2018 or early 2019, maybe 2018. Um, and then in um, 2019, when you started doing it virtually, I signed up and started doing your classes virtually just to stay with the community. And I had another best friend die in 2019. And I was so determined not to fall back the way I did back in 2012 when everybody started dying that I joined the Feel Fabulous group at that time. I, I took your class. At, before then, I had been thinking to myself, do I really want to pay for another class because I already know this stuff. I could teach this stuff. And I was like, I, I know it, you know, do I want to spend the money? And then when my friend passed away, I, I didn't hesitate. I'm like, I'm taking, I'm taking this. I need the support. I know it, but it's not going to hurt me to take it again. You know, it's, it can only help me. So I did. And I was so grateful that you had the class and I was so grateful that I signed up for it. And I, continue to do well, you know, I continue to um, lose some more weight. And I think my total weight loss was like around 100, 102 pounds from my highest weight. I don't even have a picture of myself from my highest weight, but the before and after pictures that are, um, it's about 10, the before picture is about 10 or 11 pounds under my highest weight. So it's pretty close, but I don't have one. I, I always used to hide, you know, like somebody was taking pictures. I was running behind them and hiding, you know, I, I didn't, or I try to run away and not be in photos. So, so yeah, so um, it took a while. So my, my journey, what I'd like the people to know is that my journey has not been a straight line. It's all, it's been like, you know, it looks like one of those, like, you know, heart graphs <laughs> on a heart monitor with lots of little blips, but the overall trend has gone down. And, um, you know, and I, I don't know if it'll ever, until my environment is really clean, I think I'm still going to have little struggles, you know, but I've learned things along the way. I've learned how to not, um, not uh, you know, go completely off track. If I go off track, I try to get back on as quickly as possible. Um, I've learned little tricks that I've, you know, that I've used for myself to help, to help me. Um, yeah, so that's, that's pretty much it. So, yeah. So, I mean, it's kind of taken, it's kind of, it's been, I've been losing weight since losing and then getting a little and losing some more. And then, you know, it's, um, it's been since 2003. So I don't know if I should say it's been that, you know, the past 19 years or, you know, I, it's, it's hard for me to tell you like how long it took me to lose it because it, it hasn't been straight line. So. I wish it was. <laughs> I, I wish I was what like one of those people. It's like they drop a hundred pounds or two hundred pounds and they're done, and that they just stay there. And it's like, yeah, can you bottle that and you know sell me some because I would that that's a medication I would buy, you know. But it doesn't work that way. So, but um, yeah, Zena. Yeah. Do you ever worry that you could gain it all back, or have you worried that? Um. I have worried it, uh, worried about it. Yes, I have worried about it, but I, 
like I said, even though, even in my worst moment during that four year period of time when things were just so dark, it's like people used to say, there's always a light at the end of the tunnel. And I'm like, no, there's just another tunnel for me. That's what it felt like. It just felt like I was going down, down, down tunnel after tunnel. I'm like, where's the, you know, where's the bottom? It's like, I've got to hit bottom and then I'll come. That was like the worst time. I don't think there were just so many circumstances between multiple there's, I don't have that many people left that can pass away on me. Seriously. I, I don't mean to joke about it, but it's, you know, it's true, but at the same time, I'm not, I'm not in my horrible job anymore. I'm not, you know, there's things have gotten a little easier in that regard. Um, and I have more support at least with it, with online communities and stuff, which I didn't have people, which I didn't have back then. Um, so I do worry about gaining weight back. I do not think I will gain it all back. I might gain some back. I might have gained some back now during the pandemic. I stopped weighing myself about three years ago and I just go by my clothes. And, you know, during the pandemic, they were getting kind of snug. They're getting a little looser again. So, you know, I, I think I did gain a little bit of weight and I think I've lost some of it, you know, so it's hard, you know, it's hard for me to tell, um, you know, but yeah, so. I'll just, I'll keep, I won't quit. That's, that's a thing. You, you know, you used to call me tenacious and I, I won't quit. And that's one of the things that I would encourage people to do. Like if you fall off track, if somebody falls off track, I hope that they, first of all, if they, you know, people say, don't beat yourself up. And I agree, don't beat yourself up. But if you do beat yourself up, put that aside and really look at it objectively and try to figure out why did you go off track? But that's what I've been doing, you know, this whole time. And I like really look at things and I try to judge, like I try to be very dispassionate about it and like look at it like it's almost happened to somebody else. And I like become like an investigator, like a detective. And I'm like, okay, what happened? What, why did this happen? How did it happen? What was I doing before? You know, did, you know, was I not eating? Pro you know, what, what, what were the circumstances and how, what can I do differently next time? So I don't have the same problem. So when I, done that i found things to fix the problems i've had my first solution is not always the best one um it it, it might work a little bit and then something happens and i'm like oh got to tweak it again you know and so i keep going back and i tweak and i tweak and i tweak and i think that there's got to be a solution for things so i that's i would encourage people to do that just to keep you know to keep going um this is kind of a funny thing about what happened this was during i think it was probably between sometime between 2016 and 2018, when I was doing your UWL live classes and I was at my crazy job and we had moved, our office had moved. And now instead of just having candy bowls in a couple of, by the receptionist desk, there were like literally candy bowls, like every 15 to 20 feet. And I would walk down, the, I couldn't walk from my office anywhere without walking by two or three or four or 10 candy bowls. And when I was stressed, I'd have my food with me, but some days I was so stressed and I was running from meeting to meeting to meeting that I didn't have time to sit down and actually eat. <laughs> One day I went to the bathroom at the end of the day and I was, I put my hands down in the, my back pockets of my jeans and I started pulling out candy wrappers, you know, the little fun size candy wrappers. And I literally had something like 20 or 25 candy wrappers in my back pockets. And my first thought was, who the hell was stuffing candy wrapper, empty candy wrappers down my pockets? It's like, who did that? And, <laughs> and obviously I did that. But the sad thing was, is that I was eating all this crap and I did not even get any pleasure out of it because I don't recall doing it. It was seriously like sleep eating, you know, like you're sleepwalking and eating and you don't have any recollection of it. So when I found myself doing, and I had done that before, like I'd find one or two candy wrappers, but I started finding lots of candy wrappers in my pockets because I was so busy and so crazy. So I had to figure out um, a way to around that. And I remembered from Dr. Lyle's, the path of least resistance talk that he talks about open and closed channels. So open, you wanna open channels up to make the healthy food more available and you wanna close channels um, and, and closed channels make things more difficult. So I thought, well, okay, if I want to open channels for healthy food, how can I close up channels for unhealthy food? He didn't really talk about it like that, but that's, that was my thinking as I was trying to discover a way around it. So I realized I needed like some kind of a physical barrier between me and the candy bowls because I was just grabbing and eating without thinking. So I, my final solution, I went through a couple of solutions, but my final one was I'd bring a bunch of apples in a nice bowl to work every Monday 
they were already washed. Um, they were just kind of small, smallish apples. And I'd have uh, um, next to them my notebook. And anytime I made myself, anytime I was getting up from my desk to leave my office, my clean environment, I put an apple in one hand and, a no and carry my notebook in the other. And then that way, if I was walking by and I was reaching for the candy, I, the apple or the notebook would stop me. And I, it would give me just enough of a like, oh, oh. And then I would realize, and if I still wanted something, I could just eat the apple. You know, I could take a bite of the apple. And after I did that, for the rest of the time that I was at that position, I never had another piece of candy. I never, I never took another, I never took another piece of candy from the candy bowl. So it worked, you know, but I had to like think it through and I'm just giving you kind of the end result. I think I went through two or three different scenarios. I tried different kinds of fruit, I, you know, and finally stumbled on something that worked for me. So I would just encourage people to keep doing that. If something's not working and you, you're not in a clean environment or what, whatever the issue is, keep looking for a solution. Just little tweaks can make a big difference. So, yeah. Absolutely. Let me read a couple of comments from live viewers. Mona says, I love these inspirational stories. Some days I feel like I'm slipping through the cracks and they are helpful. And Sherry says, I love your honesty, Zena, about it not being a straight line. You've been so helpful on Facebook and so inspirational. You know, one of the things I want to point out is, again, you know, it's not just about weight because regardless of your journey of maybe gaining a little bit back, you never went back to having the lifestyle diseases at first had you go to the McDougal program and you never had to go back to going on a medication. So that's really important for people to know. Yeah. And, you know, I would like to point out something else with that, AJ, um, is that, yeah, I got off of seven prescription drugs. I reversed my type two diabetes. I, you know, my blood pressure came down to normal. Um, my cholesterol came down to norm. I mean, my cholesterol went from being 269 on the, well, it was 278. And then they, I, my regular doctor had put me on Lipitor. And after 18 months of being on Lipitor, it only went down nine points. So it was 269 when I went to the McDougal program. Dr. McDougal took me off the Lipitor and the other medications on day one. By the end of the week, it dropped 51 points. And then after the, you know, a, a year later, a year or two years later, it was down to 121. And it's remained between 120 and 125 ever since 2005. So no matter what has happened with my weight, even when my weight's gone back up, my diabetes, my, my blood sugar has remained perfectly stable. And my, um, my uh, cholesterol has remained good. My blood pressure has remained good. Um, so even when I did gain back some weight, I was still doing enough right that I was able to keep the, the lifestyle diseases away. So, you know, now hopefully I will have like, a heart attack next year, but that would not, I, I don't think so. You were like in your, either, I'm guessing your thirties or early forties when you, when you first came to this information. So seven medications, what, do you remember what they were? Yeah. Um, you know what, can I, let me do this presentation. Cause I, I had, I have them on a slide. Cause that's um, a lot so, of medication. Yeah, it is. Okay. Let's see. It was a lot of medications. Okay, so yeah, this is during the. Could you um, could you just of, could you change it to view view the view mode so that yes, we don't? Let yeah. Me, let me do it, that just right click now. play. If you click play, it should work. Yeah. Okay. Play. There it goes. Yeah, there we go. There we Perfect. go. Okay. Okay. So these are um, first on day one. These were the medications I was on. It was on metformin. And while I was on metformin, my fasting blood sugar was 128. It was be, always between like 125 and 135. So that particular morning, it was 128. I was on Lipitor. My cholesterol was 269 and my triglycerides were 333. Um, then these were the two blood pressure medications that I was on. And my blood pressure was normally around 160 over 100. That was while I was on two medications. I was on nitroglycerin um, because I was having chest pain and I had failed like uh, six months earlier. I had gone to the doctor cause I was having chest pains and they did, did a treadmill test, which I failed. So I know, I'm pretty sure that I, I was, this is um, this June, 2003, it was right after my 40th birthday. So this was right. At, but by the time I was 39, I was on all, all these meds and I was getting regular migraines and then I was on an antidepressant because why wouldn't you be depressed if you had all these things? And then <laughs> after, after day seven, on day seven, um, this is my blood, my blood sugar went from 128 got down to 85. Um, my cholesterol dropped 51 points down to 218. My triglycerides did not move uh, right then in the, that first week. My blood pressure started normalizing. It got down to 122 over 82. 
no, I was having no more um, chest pains, no more migraines, and I was feeling happier. And six months later, I had eliminated the antidepressant. So that was, that was good. And then, um, and then this was two years later, uh, this was at, um, during the um, maximum weight loss program, my blood sugar again, 82, my cholesterol had dropped to uh, 121. Now my triglycerides finally dropped, they dropped down to 75. So, um, because they hadn't dropped at all uh, during the first program and Dr. McDougall really worked with me trying to get it. And it turned out that I was just eating too much fruit and fruit for people with who are sensitive um, and have triglyceride issues. It Even fresh fruit, yes, even fresh fruit, if you're eating too much, it can affect your triglycerides. So once I cut down to about two servings per day, my triglycerides dropped and became a, at a good level. My blood pressure then had stabilized around 110 over 70. Um, still, I was having no more and um, no more chest pains, no more migraines, and I wasn't on any antidepressants or anything. So, so yeah, so that was, um, yeah, so that was that was that. Yeah. Well, that's a big deal. Yeah, that was a big deal. It was, and like I said, even when I had regained weight a little bit, you know when I, my weight did fluctuate like anywhere from five to the 35, 40 pounds, actually at, when I had gained back 40 pounds, my, my cholesterol did go back up and I can't remember if my, but my blood sugar stayed okay, but my, 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 um, cholesterol did go back up, but it didn't go up over 200. It went up like maybe to 170. So it did get higher. And then when I did your program, um, it dropped back down to like 120, you know, something like that. So that was, that was good. Um, but yeah, so that was, yeah. So I'm, and I'm, I'm 50, 59 and I'm on no medications. So I'm happy to say that. And I know you're on no medication. Well, if you have, if you're on any medications, I know it's not for lifestyle diseases. So, <laughs> but I don't think you're on any meds, but I'm on no meds and I'm hoping, you know, and most people my age are getting on medication. So I started getting on medications when I was 38, 39. And it was really because of my weight was ballooning up. And I was, I, like I said, I was eating nothing but fast food for seven or eight years. Uh, you can't do that. I was having breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I was just going through different drive throughs It was like the drive through diet. And it was, it was, it was killing. I mean, it was killing me. I honestly did not, my, my, my dad's mom had passed away at like 42 or 43 years old. She had um, some kind of heart disease issues. And um, I did not think I would get past 45 going the, the rate I was going. That's why I was um, looking into, um, I'd been looking into gastric bypass surgery. And before I went to the McDougal program, because I was thinking that was the only thing that would fix me. And it, um, I was, uh, I submitted, did I already talk about that, AJ? I can't remember if I already talked about that or not. About about get, wanting gastro bypass? Yeah. Did I talk about that at all? No, not oh, yet. Okay, so <laughs> I'm kind of getting a, a little out of sync. So so before I went to the McDougal program, um, as I was you know wanting to become an ethical vegan, and um, you know I I read Dr. McDougal's book and. I couldn't, I just couldn't put it into practice because I hadn't cooked in so long. I hadn't, I, I just, I, all I knew at that point was just going through, you know, eating fast food. So it was, I wanted to do it, but I, but I couldn't. And even though I, so I started thinking I'll just cut meat out first and then I'll work on cutting out dairy. I, I cut meat out very quickly. I was, because I used to be a huge meat eater. I used to eat tons of meat. My dad used to, my dad was a butcher at one point in time. And then he later on, he was in the restaurant business. So he always did the shopping for his restaurant. And so we always had meat and he would barbecue um, steaks. Um, he would grill steaks and I'd go over and uh, for like Sunday, you know, for a Sunday meal and he'd do these 24 ounce steaks and he'd give me one and I'd eat the whole thing. And then he'd give me a second one and I'd eat the whole thing. Then he'd give me half of his and I'd eat that. I would eat like 48 to 60 ounces of meat in a single sitting. And I ended up giving up meat like overnight. I mean, I basically just decided I'm not going to eat any, any meat anymore. And I did that, but dairy became my big problem. So that's when I started getting sick because my dairy increased. And that's when up to that point, I was just overweight, but that's when, you know, I was in my late thirties and my, um, it seems to me that most people I know when they get sick, they're in their late thirties. Uh, so yeah, um, I started, by, um, I started thinking there's no diet that's going to help me. 
I just need to go and, um, you know, have gastric bypass surgery. And there was a particular surgery I wanted. Um, I think it's called a duodenal switch. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Duodenal or duodenal, something like that. And that's where they re they make your stomach smaller, but then they also reroute your um, intestines so that your, your stomach, it empties out into your large intestine. It bypasses three quarters of your intestinal tract and they call it malabsorption. So you're not absorbing the calories, but you're also not absorbing nutrients. And I thought this was going to be what would work for me. So I went to a doctor, uh, I traveled to see a surgeon up in San Francisco who was performing it. And they told me that I should lose, um, that I should gain five pounds so that I would qualify for it um, easily. And I gained 25 pounds because I never do things by small measure. And um, anyway, so I, I was thinking to myself that when I was waiting for the insurance company to approve it and they approved my weight loss surgery, but they didn't approve the surgery that I wanted. They approved a different one that was, um, it wouldn't give me the results that I was looking for, or so I thought. So I was going back and forth with them. And then I um, went to the McDougal program um, because I just wanted to get off dairy. That's really the only reason I went. I didn't think it was going to help me lose weight. I didn't think it was going to help me get healthy or anything. And so I, um, I went there and while I was there, I, you know, like I said, Dr. McDougal became my physician. I also met Dr. Lyle. I heard the pleasure trap story, the, the concept behind the pleasure trap. I heard Dr. Lyle's, um, when he was talking about the pleasure trap and then Dr. McDougal talked about calorie density. And I got those two lectures on the same day. And that's kind of when my brain clicked. And I just thought, this is terrifying, but I know that weight loss surgery is not gonna work for me because it's not gonna fix my brain. It's gonna do something to my stomach. But up until that point, I thought I was broken and I wasn't broken. It, the food was broken. That's, and that's like getting that information. I, like, I had goosebumps and I was like terrified and excited. And you know, just, I didn't know what I was gonna do, but I kept, I kept, you know, I was still there at the 10 day program and I got these amazing results, you know, getting off all my medications. I lost seven pounds that first week, which seven pounds in a week is pretty good. And I'm sure most of it was water, but, you know, maybe a couple of pounds of fat, maybe five pounds of water, but seven, the scale went down, you know, seven pounds and that wasn't bad. I was still really huge. I mean, people, nobody, nobody even could tell that I had lost any weight until I lost 45 pounds. So uh, nobody noticed. And I didn't say anything to anybody about it. I was waiting for somebody to say, Hey, you're losing weight. You're looking good. And I had to lose about 45, 50 pounds before people say, have, have you lost a little bit of weight? And I'm like, I've lost almost 50 pounds. But, um, the, uh, when I got home from the McDougal program, from, from this first McDougal program, my letter from the insurance company, my appeal letter was there. And that was the letter that was going to let me know whether or not they approved the, the surgery that I had. They had approved the surgery, but I wanted the other one. And I waited for a couple of days and then I threw the letter away without even reading it because I knew I was just never going to go and have the surgery. So that was kind of a relief because later on I found out um, people told me that they had relatives who'd had the surgery that I wanted and had either died or they lost their teeth. They lost their hair. Um, they were very, very sick from it because, you know, it's you know, surgery is not, again, it's trying to, the, the problem isn't, wasn't my stomach. The problem, it wasn't my intestinal tract. It wasn't that I was absorbing calories or nutrients. Our, our bodies are supposed to, you know, we're supposed to absorb all that stuff. It was because my brain was getting the wrong signals from the food, the eating the wrong food. So it was the food that was broken and that's what needed to be fixed. And having surgery was not going to fix the food. So I had to do that myself. So, yeah. Yeah, that's an amazing story, Zena. I didn't even tell Dr. McDougall that story till maybe about, 11 or 12 years later, I didn't even want him to know that I had been, when I was at his program, I was waiting for um, my insurance letter to tell me whether or not I, got, I, they, I could have gastric bypass surgery. I was so embarrassed by that, but now I tell people because I think people should know. I mean, I think that's important to know. Well, you're helping a lot of people. I love, you know, a lot of people that are watching live know you from Feel Fabulous and other places, but if people don't, you're like one of the top coaches in my programs and, you know, you're walking the talk. And I, I wonder, you know, I don't know if you've been watching all week with the other people that have struggled. What, what do you think the difference is that sometimes, you know, I feel so bad for people that when they go, go through all the trouble to lose weight and then they gain it back, 
you you seem to be able to put the brakes on at you know it, when it when it starts you know you don't you never went all the way back i never went all the way back but i went all, maybe a third of the way back you know or, or a little bit more than a third you know close to half of the way back but um at, during that period of time that four year period of time i it was such a slippery slope and i just i could not get my footing again i i just couldn't because there was just too much going on and i i just couldn't claw my way out of it. And then when I finally did claw my way out of it, I just learned more. I just keep learning. And like I said, I keep trying to evaluate what, where I went wrong. And I try to put in systems or things in place so I don't go back down that path. You know what I mean? So I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure there's different, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's hard. It's, I, I think that I could have, you know, if you hadn't contacted me and if I hadn't grabbed your lifeline that you were throwing me, maybe I would have gained all my weight back, AJ. I don't know. Honest, I'm, I'm being honest. I, I honestly, I don't know. Maybe I would have. I felt like I was still, I, I, I needed something. I needed to get back on track. And that's what ended up helping me get back on track. I was either going to go to another McDougal program because that had always helped me in the past. You were closer. So I was like, <laughs> closer and cheaper. <laughs> yeah, you're closer and cheaper. Yeah. And I'm, you know, and I, I still did, um, and I couldn't, at that time also, I couldn't take the time away because I was, uh, my mom, my, I had my mother living with me and I, her sole caregiver. So I, it was really hard for me to go away. Um, and you were within driving distance. And so I was able to, you know, do that once a week. So that was, that was another deciding factor. But, you know, beyond that, it was also the ongoing sense of community because I met people from that program that I'm still friends with today. And um, yeah, so I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I have, you know, I haven't been watching the, I, I decided I would watch the, um, the other interviews after my interview was over because I was so nervous to do this <laughs> that I didn't want to make myself more nervous. No, you, you're doing great. And, you know, I do miss those in-person programs. We haven't really run them since I lived in LA in 2019, I think was the last one we were in two, that fall of 2018 because I, I sure didn't do it in the desert. Nobody was interested, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. See, it's, it's hard. Do you think the fact that you help other people now helps you stay the course? I think so. I, I, and I see that with other people who have gone through your programs and now um, are mentoring others, like in, you know, going back to the reboot programs, like if I can mention Susanna, you know, she, you did a wonderful interview with her not too long ago and she's been great. She's in the, she's taking the reboot again. I think this might be, I know it's at least her second, it could be her third time. And she's, she's mentoring people in, in such a lovely way. I, I mean, and I, I'm hoping it's helping her because she's doing great. And other people, I see other people doing the same thing. Um, I think when you learn and you, try to teach other people, I think it does help you stay on track. I mean, yeah. it, it does for me. Yeah. Or just being booked on Chef AJ Live. <laughs> yeah, that, that too. That too. <laughs> well, Susanna says, Zena, you're doing an amazing job. You don't you. Seem, seem nervous at all. Okay. I saw a question for you from Kathy about your environment. I want to grab it exactly as she wrote it. Here it is. How does Zena work with her imperfect environment? Great question, Kathy. Okay. So I've, again, I've done several different stages let's say because when i when i first started happening and i realized that i was getting into the pita bread that i would buy for my mother um what i first did and i should have pulled the picture for this but i'll describe it i have a magnet with chef aj on it and she's saying don't you dare or she's no she says don't even think about it i think that's what it says so i made a photocopy of that and i taped it to the outside of the um opaque grocery bag and i put all her bread in there tied it up. We always keep the bread in the freezer to keep it fresh, tied it up. And then I put other stuff on top of it so that if I was going to get bread out, when I pulled the stuff on top of it, I'd see AJ looking at me. Don't you think about it? Don't, don't hey, it works. It. I have gold hammer going like this. I mean, you know, yeah. you want to look at that mug, you know? Yeah, exactly. And so that worked for me for about, I stayed out of it for maybe about 10 months, you know, out of the bread. And then I don't know, I slipped, I had a piece of bread and oh my goodness, down the rabbit hole I went. So then I had to reevaluate because the bag wasn't working anymore, even with AJ on it, telling me, don't even think about it. It just wasn't working for me anymore. So the next thing that I did is I got um, some food safes and I put her st the stuff that I have for her in these food safes. I got two of them in the freezer and I did a makeshift one that I have in the deli drawer in the refrigerator because I have like the vegan cheeses and stuff like that for her um, that I put in there. And so 
So I, um, I put a padlock on it. I put a key. She's bedridden. So she, I have to, I'm the one who shops for it. And I'm the one who has to open it up and give it to her. So again, I can fall off track very easily. If I'm pulling something out, what's to stop me from eating, you know, some taking a bite or two or three or 10. Um, so, <laughs> so then what I, what I did with that, when I, I put a padlock on it and I put the keys to the padlocks on, um, on a uh, ribbon and I gave it to her, like she would put it around her neck. So when I was going to go get stuff out for her, I would grab the keys, take the stuff out and give it back. Again, it's not perfect because it's I'm still handling it so I could put stuff in my mouth and that was happening. Most recently, I added a third layer on that. This is what I'm talking about. It's like you have to put you have to put blockades, you have to put barriers between at least I do. I have to put barriers between me and the the stuff that I don't want to be getting into. So um, I started wearing a mask when I'm preparing her food because it's very easy. Like a, a piece of a crumb of the bread breaks off. It's very easy for me just to put it in my mouth. But if I have the mask, I can't, you know, it's like, Oh, it, that, that little barrier right there stops me. So that's my latest thing. I just started doing that maybe about a month or so ago. And I tried it before I had tried doing it before with like a bandana, but it kept slipping. So, um, and then I tried it with a mask also, but I would take the mask off and then forget it. So what I did this time is I tied a ribbon on the, the, the earpieces. And so I, I could put it around my neck, kind of like, you know, people who wear glasses and they have the chain on the glasses that they just so their glasses are always here. So I'll put that on and I'll just have the mask around my neck so I can just easily pull it up. I'm not like looking for it. So it's, yeah, it's kind of, it's might seem silly. I don't know, but it's, that's what I need to do for myself. Wow. Do you have any more photos in your presentation? Yeah. Um, let me, yeah, let me, okay. Let me, oh, is uh, okay. So here's some pictures from, this is my childhood. This is me and my cousin. I was two years old. My cousin is two and a half. So you can already see my little gut there kind of getting big. I was already bigger than her, um, even though she was half a year older than me. And these are, this is me when I was eight years old and I was um, 4'11 at 135 pounds. Um, my, this is my other, that's the, the same cousin from the other photo. She's eight and a half in here. And this cousin is 12 and a half. And I'm getting really close to the 12 and a half year old size, even though she's almost five years older than me. Um, and then this was my 12th birthday. And I, all of us here are 12 years old. And I, this is why I felt like a freak for most of my life, because I was always so much bigger than everybody. Um, here I, I hit five foot six. Um, I'm five foot six now. And I hit uh, 165 pounds. That's what I was, um, five, six. Yeah. 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 And and then this is my graduate, this is at my college graduation. I hit 235 pounds. Even though but from, from high school, when I graduated high school, I was 185. I graduated college at 235. And those 50 pounds at, for five years, I was every day I was getting up and saying, I'm starting my diet today. This was five years of dieting, folks. <laughs> and that's what happened to me. I gained 50 pounds because no matter how much I start, you know, how much I tried. Uh, and then this is the one time um, about a year after my graduation, I put myself on a starvation diet where I was eating about 450 to 500 calories. And I did that maybe for about six months and I got down to 160 and um, I kept that weight off for about four years. Um, and I was eating obviously more than that at, at that point. Um, I started eating quite a bit more than that, but I was um, exercise. I, I was going to the gym multiple times a day. I was working out seven, seven days a week. I was doing 30 mile bike rides on the weekends um, and just aerobics classes, all sorts of stuff just to maintain that weight loss. But then what happened was I got laid off from work and I stopped, um, I stopped working out. I stopped doing my portion control. I started going through fast food rest and this is, this is what happened. So I was, um, you know, and the first two pictures on the, on the left, I was still feeling okay back then. And I didn't like, until I looked at it today, I was like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize how much weight I already started putting back on. And then this is in my, this is not my highest weight, but this is in my late thirties, the one on the right. Um, and then let me show those. Okay. And then, wow, this is I love it. This is after your unprocessed classes when I was still doing um, multiple um, 
the uh, maximum weight loss program, but you were doing the unprocessed classes. And I was, the only thing I wasn't eating from your unprocessed stuff was the nuts because I already knew that nuts, I couldn't, I couldn't handle nuts. So um, this is where I'd lost, uh, I'd lost, um, I think 35, I think I lost the 35 or 40 pounds that I gained. I, I, yeah. So, um, and then after that, that I, like I talked about um, from 2000, from mid July, 2012 to July, 2016, everything was, um, yeah, not, not good. Um, and then I rejoined your classes and then this is from 2019. And this is what, what I started doing. I was, I'm, you know, still obviously follow UWL and um, MWL, um, but I started adding veggies for breakfast and it took me two years, folks. <laughs> I say this a lot now because I want people to understand. It took me two years to start adding the vegetables for breakfast because I was, um, I was uh, really resistant to that in the beginning when AJ, when I came back to your classes in 2016 and you were talking about it, I was like, no, I don't think so. <laughs> I was like, no, I, I'll eat vegetables after breakfast, but not before before breakfast. And so I really, I really resisted for a very long time for about two years. And then finally what ended, I, I started by, by accident, really, I'd made the roasted, your roasted glazed Brussels sprouts and I'd made them for dinner. I made a double batch so I could take some with me for, uh, to work for lunch. And that morning I was packing up my lunch and I was, I started eating some, you know, I popped one in my mouth and it was from the refrigerator. Oh my gosh, it was so sweet and yummy. I ended up standing in the refrigerator and just ate all the Brussels sprouts. So I, <laughs> I was like, oh, I just had my first veggies for breakfast. So that, that's what got me started on that. And let's see, um, this is from the UWL conference. See, I don't have a lot of heavy pictures of myself. This one and the other one are pretty, are the heaviest pictures I have. And then I do have an old pair of jeans that I kept. Um, that I wore to the McDougal program, my first McDougal program, and that's the current pair of jeans. And like I said, I'm not perfect, but I will, and I will likely struggle forever, but I, I won't quit. I won't, until my environment can be clean, I, I don't know if I'll continue to struggle. I might, but I don't think I will. You know, because AJ, you taught me something really important was the idea of abstinence. And even though I don't have a clean environment at home, I no longer go to restaurants. And like I said earlier, vegan restaurants were kind of my downfall because I just, I don't order smart there when I go there. I can order smart somewhere else, but I can't stand the smell of meat. So I, I don't like going to other restaurants. So yeah, I have to stay away from restaurants. So I, I, that was that whole part of abstinence. I think when you talked about that, once it's sunk into my head, it's, I know that that's where I need to be. So, uh, so that, that's that. I, let's see, are we out of time? I have some food pictures, but um, no, go ahead. You can go a little bit longer. It's no problem. If you, okay. So this Ooh, is, I, I know just, what that is. is. That's black bean mushroom. Well, it looks like black bean mushroom chili. No, though. it is. This is actually, it looks like it, but it's, um, it's actually, this is something I learned from Jeff Novick. It's a five ingredient dish and you just change, you do beans, canned beans, canned tomatoes, spice, uh, uh, frozen veggies, and a starch, and um, you can change them around. Like you can change the beans to like garbanzo beans. You can have a, a curry style dish and you change the vegetables. You know, you just change the spices and everything. So this is just something I threw together. And on the picture on the um, right, I just had it. You can't see the rice, but it was on top of rice. Then what I did the next day is I took, took the leftovers that I had and I added oats to them and I cooked them in my little silicone muffin um, pan and I stuck them in the microwave. And that's what I got. I got these like little, you know, I'll do veggie burgers like that. I'll take like your chili recipes and I'll add oats to them and I'll make veggie burgers because it's got everything in it. It's got the mushrooms, it's got the tomatoes, it's got the beans, it's got the vegetables and everything. I just add oats and then I can make veggie burgers or like little starchy muffins like this. And then um, I, I'll, I, I like really simple things. I'll do your, your soup. I love your cauliflower bisque when I used to not like cauliflower. Now I love it. Um, and I will reuse this, the leftovers and make so many different dishes. So this is one thing where I added mushrooms and greens to it. Um, this is another thing where I did it like kind of like a curry dish. I'll add the, the I'll use the cauliflower bisque kind of, it's like a nice thick sauce. I'll add curry seasoning to it. I'll add a few drops of coconut um, extract and then um, different kinds of vegetables and it, the, the curry seasonings and everything. It makes it like a really nice curry dish. This is another soup, you know, the cauliflower bisque. I added broccoli and some smoked paprika on that one. Another way, you know, different vegetables. And then I added some pineapple. Um, this one was a curry dish and I added pineapple to it and some um, 
like I said, the coconut extract and some garbanzo beans. And I put it on top of rice that made a nice little curry. Um, that's one of my veggie burgers that I made with um, one of your chili recipes. I can't remember. It might've been the mushroom chili. I can't remember which one. I have it with a salad. And those are potato buns. I just take some little Yukon potatoes, smash them, microwave them first, then smash them. And I put them in the um, air fryer for a little bit till they get a little toasty and then make nice little hamburger buns or veggie burger buns, I should say. Most of my food is really simple. This is just like a Japanese sweet potato with some steamed broccoli and some raw tomatoes, um, a hana yam on the other side with some cherry tomatoes and some of the um, balsamic glazed Brussels sprouts. Um, I, I'll do a lot of soups, you know, so these are some different soups. And then um, I think, and this, these are just different veggies, you know, different ways I'll have veggies. I think this one on the left might've been with the cauliflower bisque again. And then these are just some air fried veggies and some greens and mushrooms on the far. Your food looks amazing. Thank you. And I don't eat, yeah. I'm not usually eating this. This looks fancier than what I eat, but the, the things that they're really simple because I use a lot of frozen vegetables. I'll use like leftovers, like the, like I said, the cauliflower bisque or your curry kabocha, uh, curry kabocha soup is really good for using it as a sauce too. Um, this is uh, some leftover rice that I took and I cut up and I um, mixed in some, I mixed up some um, nutritional yeast and some seasoning like garlic powder, onion powder, some different seasonings, and I coated it and then I put it in the air fryer for just a little bit just to kind of make, and it's really good. And then I'll have that with a salad and just some falafel and um, falafel I made and with some salad there. And this is just some leftover mashed potatoes. So I'll either do like little air fried balls like that or stuff them in, um, make some jalapeno poppers, some dessert. Usually my dessert is just fresh fruit 99% um, of the time, but sometimes I'll do some ice cream like the cherry banana and ice cream. And then this is on the um, on the right is, um, it, it's just a can of yam that I blended up with a little bit of the lemon balsamic, um, California balsamic vinegar, the Simply Lemon. And then I did um, some roasted pears. I um, just put them, cut them up. Uh, there's some canned pears and put them in the air fryer and got them a little, you know, caramelized and just, it was really good. Maybe and, you could write a book, eating clean in an unclean environment. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so that's it. That's my picture. Man, your food looks delicious. Jerry's saying, ah, the many lives of cauliflower bisque. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's not the only soup I do, but it's my favorite one. So Same here. I re it's pretty much the only one I do. <laughs> yeah, it, it, you know, it takes other spices really well. And like, I, like I'll, I've added curry seasoning to it I've, um, or I've added Mexican seasonings to it. I'll use seasoning blends just to make it. I'm, I'm like the type of person, I'll take the easiest recipe there is and I'll try to make it easier still because I'm a lazy, lazy person. So that's just my, my way of making it work for me. So, but usually that's, you know, the main thing I do is I try to get, you know, batch prep some sweet potatoes, um, I'll have some, you know, I'll microwave some regular potato russets or Yukon Golds. Um, I'll, I'll batch a big salad. And that's pretty much my batch cooking. And if I just have that much, then I can be successful. And then if I want to do a little bit more, if I want to make a soup or a sauce or something like that, then that's just. That's but you love cooking. the food, right? Oh, I love the food. Are you kidding? Yeah. And I, it's amazing how simply I eat now and how happy eating simply makes me. It's like I, I eat a Japanese sweet potato and I think, how did I not know that these exist? No, it's what I, that's what I had for lunch. It was so good. I love those. Yeah, what was there's, there's, you want to tell people about the funnest night we ever had? Oh, uh, with Dr. McDougall? Is yeah. That, yeah. So, um, yeah, he was, Dr. McDougall was speaking at the Orange County um, Veg Fest. And um, I wanted to invite him over for dinner because I was only 20 minutes away from there. So I wanted to invite him and Mary over for dinner. I've known him for 19 years and I love Dr. McDougal. He's, he's my hero. I mean, he's just, he's amazing. And um, so AJ, I had asked AJ and I said, are you gonna go to the Veg Fest? And she's like, no, I'm not. And then they asked her to speak. And she's like, oh, now I'm going to the Veg Fest. And I would, what, if, what if we invite Dr. McDougal over? So I was like, yeah. So she, you contacted him or Mary, I think to invite them over. And I you know, remember Mary goes, but you don't live in Orange County. And I go, I know, I know, oh, I know, I know. <laughs> so, yeah. so I was living, yeah, I live in Orange County. So yeah, so I, I went and I picked them up at the airport and then we, um, we I took them to their hotel. And then we, when, when um, it was time for the Veg Fest, we, you and I, and um, oh, I'm dra drawing a blank on her name. Oh, she's so sweet. Oh my gosh, your friend that, now I'm drawing a total blank on her name. Okay. Jen Shipley? 
Yes, Jen. Yes, she's so sweet. So the three of us, we went, we picked them up and we went, took them to the veg fest and then brought them back to my place. We made them dinner. You made your cauliflower bisque. We did air fried potatoes. Um, we did the Brussels sprouts. We did the Brussels sprouts. We did, you, you, you brought, <laughs> I remember you brought your big juicer, champion juicer, and you made ice cream. The banana ice cream. cream. Remember the sprinkles you got at Penzi's that looked like sugar sprinkles, but they were made out of sweet potatoes. They were made out of sweet potatoes. And I had gotten like five jars of them and I gave one to everybody who was there. That was, and, I'll never, yeah. that was one of my favorite nights. It was so fun. It was so it was fun. funny. I, I was so nervous though. I was, I, I've known, I've known Dr. McDougall and Mary forever, but I, I was just really nervous. Wait, there was one other fun. person there we invited. A friend. Oh, it was um, Pam. Was I think Pam, was Pam. right. Just, yeah, yeah. So there were six of us. Yeah. So that was, yeah. That's when I got my Breville. I got my new dining room table because it seated six people because before I just had a little tiny one that only seated four people. So I was kind of remodeling before you came over. But that was yeah. great. We had the best time. That was fun. Good it was times. Fun. If do you, do you do any posting or anything on social media, if people want to connect with you after this broadcast or find, I'm, you know, I'm on Facebook, uh, but I really mainly on, I'm not in some of Dr. McDougall's, uh, some of, they're not his uh, Facebook groups, but um, they're Facebook groups for Dr. McDougall, but I'm on the feel fabulous um, Facebook group, which is a private group that, um, and the feel fabulous membership group as well. There's a forum there. And um, I moderate both of those forums, the Facebook one and the, 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 Feel Fabulous Forum as well. And um, yeah, so if people want to do a one month trial for a dollar, they can they can try the Feel Fabulous thing. And I'm doing um, a Saturday check-in and then a Wednesday afternoon um, live with Pam. And um, yeah, and then well, Angela has been doing some exercise classes. We had an exercise class with Angela um, yesterday that I hosted. So yeah, it's really fun to connect with people. I love connecting with people who are doing this and, and through your reboot class, um, get to meet so many, yeah, we're doing the reboot right now. We're more than halfway through and people are doing really well, I think. Um, I hope they're all enjoying it. And it's very fun to connect with them as well on the forum there. So yeah. You do, you do such a great job. Thank, thank you so much, Zena. I really you. appreciate all you do to help people. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate all you do to help people, AJ. I mean, you're phenomenal. So oh, well, thank yeah. you. Well, we're both Aries. Aries yeah. rock, right? That's yeah. right. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Aries power. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're delightful. And yeah, she had no reason to be nervous. So oh, thank you. Okay. <laughs> and I and I did tell her, I said, you know, if she doesn't like it, I'll delete it afterwards. Okay. That's fine. I, ho I hope I hope it's helpful to some people. Um, I would just say, you know, don't forget to eat your starch, eat your veggies, but don't forget your starch. Yeah, that's the thing. That, Can't forget really, the starch. Yeah, but I do think that mixture with the, ve I think there's something in veggies that just. Yeah, no, it's both. I think I really think it's both, especially starting. I really like starting with vegetables first. So I remember telling Dr. Lyle about it one time and, and he's like, oh, do you do that vegetable thing too? And he's like, do you like it? And he kind of looked at me like he didn't think that I liked it. And I'm like, yeah, I really like it, Dr. Lyle. And he was like, oh, okay. Yeah, so it was, it was funny. It was, um, I, I was confessing, you know, I was like, yeah, I really do like the vegetables for breakfast. And I, I miss it. I feel different when I don't have it, you know, but I, I, I know for myself that I do need the starch soon afterwards oh, because yeah. if I don't have that. I will, I, it, and it won't matter how much salad or how many veggies I eat. If it's only non-starchy veggies, you know, a few hours go by and my, my brain starts doing this like a little wacky thing. And I'm just like, oh, no, I, you know, so yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's I like the keys don't happen. I think it just creates maximum enjoyment for the veggies because yeah. once you start, you're not going back and eat, at least I'm not going back. And exactly. Eat exactly. And it's, it's, you know, I'll even put like my sweet potato or potatoes in the bottom of my huge, um, salad bowl and I'll pile tons of salad on top of it. And then that way I have to eat through my salad to get to the potatoes. It's kind of like buried treasure in there. And it's, it's yummy because all the juices from the, from the vegetables kind of soak into the potato. It makes it even tastier. So yeah. So then I'll eat like probably three quarters of my salad and it's a huge salad. I'm usually doing like a salad. That's maybe about a pound and a half to two pounds <laughs> and um, maybe about a pound and a half. And then the sweet potatoes, you know, underneath there. And um, so I'm eating like maybe about a pound of salad before I get to the sweet potato. Then I'm eating the rest of the salad mixed in with the sweet potato. Yeah. So I mean, you know what I've been doing, Zina, because yeah. the, the Murasaki from Trader Joe's, they just keep getting tinier and tinier. Uh -huh. And so what I do is I, I just wrap romaine around it. 
And I, oh, that's cool. That's kind of like, kind of like a burrito, you know? Yeah, so. make it a little bit. But hey, you have to come. There's there's um, a Middle Eastern um, farmers market that I go to, and they have the Japanese sweet potatoes for a really good. But they're not organic, but they're 99 cents a pound. And some of them sometimes they're small, but sometimes they're like huge. And I when I when I see them huge, I think of you because <laughs> I know you I like. like well, because that way, that when they're huge, you only have to eat one. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Uh, Susanna says, "I love the way you describe the potatoes as the very treasure." That's awesome. Well, Zena, thank you so much thank for so much. reclaiming your health, but at the same time, helping others re- find theirs. Thank you. You're so welcome. All right. Take care, Zena. I'll thank see you soon. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. We have two more days of Food Addiction Recovery Week. And tomorrow at 11 a.m. Pacific time, we have Dr. Vera Tarman, and she's going to be talking about food addiction 